Hi, and a lovely good evening, the second evening of DVOC Reboot to Respond. This is the last talk for tonight, and it will be about art. It will be the um, ZLDKM. They have been in chaos for many, many years, starting at the 19 C3, where they got to know each other, and now they do projects together at events, museums, companies, trade for halls, public spaces, and on the internet. They have one name, but they are quite different. They have both got the university qualifications from school, but the one of them um, had it through the evening classes. Um, they have both graduated, they have both published scientific papers, one studied art and one, um, they were both born in the divided Germany, one in the Far East, one in the Far West, uh, both entrepreneurs, one in programs, um, they're from Aachen and Hamburg. Hmm. Old audio suddenly cut off. Welcome in, diesem Internet. in this wir Internet. We are happy to be able to broadcast to you here and become a part of the digitally distributed online chaos. The motto, Reboot to Respawn, Restart to Reappear, of well, it's very fitting, not just at the in the Easter context, which has something with being reborn, of course, or of rising again, but it fits our project quite well, because it was quite the same there. We said, yes, we will have to restart. We have to regain visibility and do something again. The project is quite a child of the pandemic. I think without it, it wouldn't have been created. We are ZLDKM, and behind this rather unwieldy name, there is an abbreviation. It means two people that do art. The German words for that spell out ZLDKM. That was a working title, and as it so often happens, the title remains. So that's what we are. So our focus on, is on the future, and we'll start straight away with the first question, which is why. It used to be the case that we would meet in a place, we would sit at a desk and work in the same workshop, work on the same thing. That is impossible, has been for a while now, or yes, not so well possible or impossible. So what do artists do in a situation like this? We said interventions. Interventions in the sense of, yeah, it's all very unpleasant right now, but yeah. We say waiting is not an option. We need to move forward and do a few things. So art as an experiment, and the question to be researched is, can art be done in this way? Is it possible with the given restrictions to create art, to be creative and to develop new ideas and innovations? And if so, how? Our focus, just to make this transparent to you, which is why you see this frame around these bullet points here. We're in this frame, but there is an outside as well. So just to make this clear, our aim is to have art as an immediate result. That's what we define. There is the opposite as well. You could say that the process of making art is open but we decided not to work in this way. We said there has to be a result at the end. The second item is less who, more how and what. In an artistic context, it's often important who does something and less how it is done or what is being done. 
And we said if we have a scale, a balance, and if we decide what is more important than the other, one example is this talk here. It is important to us to make a statement here to create an approach rather than saying artists don't speak, they don't explain. We are not going to say that this is bad or good or better than other approaches. It's just as valid in an artistic process to say, well, we leave it to the observer to interpret and we are not going to make any statements. But we decided to do it differently. We will make a statement. We will explain. Art as a motor of change, as inspiration and as a mirror, these are meta levels uh, that we could talk about, uh, think about uh, after the talk. We believe that there is quite something to find out if you want to, to recognize. You are welcome to think about the term of art. Uh, you could say that, well, this is a technical, just to play with technology. Is it art? How far does it go? Is it a technical realization or something? Is it from at what point does it become art? We cannot answer this question. We can only invite you to think about this. We say art as an immediate intermediate aid. It's not a hidden credit that we have to pay uh, in the future. It is an investment in the future in which, in which we want to live in. And we mean that quite seriously without a pinch of salt because reality um, does seem to be lacking a course right now. We started in February, so this project is about two months old. Just to give you an idea, we use Big Blue Button as a think tank, and we added a wiki for documentation, and that's where we can start. So what did we actually do? We took, looked at digital art and net art, we did, ran a market analysis and researched, and what we can tell you is what is out there is in me un incredibly large. There are so many things and it's fun to look into them and uh, immerse yourself into them. It's just, it's a bit like reading Wikipedia. You start at one page and suddenly you have 50 tabs open and much the same, it's much the same with net art. You can, you can come from one to the other. It's a lot of fun. I can only recommend that you try and it's a good alternative to uh, a streaming evening. In our market analysis, we identified a few large topics. We found several, but there are three large ones that we would like to point out. For one, there is the problem of access. If digital art is to be consumed, you have to overcome a certain threshold. It can be a small or a large one. In the easiest case, it's just using the web browser and accessing the internet. But it goes on to having to use, install and use certain apps, which is a certain hurdle. If you are limited to certain operating systems or devices and have to fulfill certain technical requirements, if you have to have certain frameworks installed on your computer first, if you have to use certain hardware such as gaming consoles uh, or have certain games installed on them, and sometimes you have to have certain keep to certain times. There are exhibitions that are in games on a game console which you have to have in the first place and buy. You have to you have these games. And then within those games, you have to reach a certain competency or level. And often then you have to email the artist perhaps and arrange a date. So that makes it all kind of difficult. It's much like having to make an appointment at an authority in a different time zone. But if you manage to be in the right place at the right time, it can be worth it.
Um, warum manchmal the reasons why exhibitions are not online available online indefinitely has good reasons. Uh, one keyword there is vandalism. Art often is uh, conditioned by technology. Uh, it means that you have to use a certain technology, and if you use it in the way it is intended, the question is: Is that now art? Those of you that come from the surroundings of the KS Computer Club will know Wau Holland, and you will know a few quotes of his, which is one one of it, which is a hacker that tries to find a path, is, is someone who tries to find a way of making toast with a coffee machine or soup. So the thinking is, you have a device, you have a technology, and you try to use it for a different purpose in a sensible way, in a way that creates sense, but in a way that wasn't intended in the first place. So if you just look at this first item, too easy, not very exciting, that is the way that art is normally linked to technology. So you imagine a smartphone with an augmented reality app and you use that to walk through your apartment to perhaps look at pictures on the wall that aren't there in the first place and swap them for others and maybe have an artist there that you couldn't normally buy because it's too expensive or too available. Well, that is fun and it may be an excellent use of technology, but the question is, is that now art? And the question is, what should be the level of the creation? The, um, and on the other end of the scale, the topic is, is it too complicated? Is it impossible to understand? Because too many technological obstacles have to be overcome. And even for us as technically um, versatile people, it sometimes was very difficult to get access to certain artistic creations. You had to do a lot of research and experimenting before you actually were, uh, arrived where you wanted to go. And you, even then you weren't quite sure if, it, if you, what you saw was what was intended, because maybe you had a different firmware, a different version of something that could be side effects. So you're wondering, is what I'm seeing an artifact or is it actually part of the artistic creation or process? So that's the kind of scale on which which, uh, or be in between which there wasn't that much to be found. Third item, vandalism, bullies and trolls. Some of you may have heard even established exhibitions on the internet were robbed there was vandalism, there was rioting. <laughs> so this kind of scene that normally has its protected spaces takes its exhibitions and, and puts it into this shark pool and suddenly the whole internet comes there and, and does things and uh, that would be some result of a digital exhibition sometimes. But then there are groups that look for things like this and actively uh, assault uh, visitors, destruct, destroy things, maybe record this, harass people, and then are happy with that and, and celebrate their, quote, success if they were able to, to scare people away. So you have to think about these things. And what did we deduce from that? First, uh, it was important to us, if we do art in a public space, you have to have easy access, it should be possible to interact and participate, it should be interesting even for people that don't understand too well how it works, but it should also be possible to find out how it works. It should be resilient against vandalism. It should be a bridge into real life through interaction, perhaps. 
and we want to make it possible to create this connection to the world of the art and galleries to not be restricted in the digital bubble that we probably know fairly well, but we do want to get into the real world. And those were our deductions that we had as objectives. So what did we start with? Our first topic was more or less randomly chosen. We started with Pete Mondrian because we liked the epoch, we liked his pictures, one of which you can see in the slide, it's uh, black lines with uh, colors filled in. It's about 100 years old. In 1921, he started doing these pictures, and he's one of the co-founders of abstract painting. And I personally really like his art, and that was the reason we started getting into his work more. Pete Mondrian was often cited and his style was uh, cited in art, architecture, fashion, advertisement, popular culture, you name it. So his art is very well known visually and this kind of image is well known and which is also something that is also fascinating is that Pete Mondrian saw himself as a painter of landscapes, something you wouldn't think from while well, just seeing his images, but I can only recommend you to get into his art and his way of painting because he started with picturing man standing on a horizontal line. So that is his a 90 degree angle, which is the basis for his artwork. And in this 90 degree angle, he sees things like um, dichotomies like man and woman and other images that are opposed to each other. Below you can see how he put that style into fashion. And what we do is we try to make this format digital. So what do you do when you want to convert something to the digital word? Of course, you need computers. So we decided to have computers generate Pete Mondrian style pictures. So use the computers to make the image. Our automatic Mondrian composes these kind of images. What do they consist of? First, every picture is a rectangle. It has a certain size and a certain uh, format. It can be portrait, landscape, quadratic, whatever. And in this case, well, in, in the Mondrian case, we have divisions with black lines and assigned colors. So we need an algorithm that divides a rectangle and an algorithm that assigns colors. Mondrian used a lot of white, a little blue, a little red, and some black. And to do the division, we had two different approaches. The first approach assumes a rectangle, divides it, and the divided rectangles are then further split up. And we do that for, well, we do a few runs of that until we have a satisfactory image. The second is you take a horizontal or a vertical line, and to make it more interesting and not too simple, we had a third method, which is inserting a smaller rectangle into the big one, which you see on the right side, and then take the border 
and divide that into rectangles and as well. And then we also take rect um, rectangular lines from the borders to divide up the rest. The second method is the exact opposite. We do a maximum division first, so the maximum number of small rectangles starting from the edges and then in the second step some of these lines are deleted or uh, merged into rectangles and this is an example of how this can work and in the end you have a mondrian like structure so now we have an algorithm that is able to create images in a structured way and also to assign colors. But then we still have the question, where do the lines go and which colors are assigned? And to do that, the algorithm needs input. And this is our version of digital inspiration. We put a lot of thought into that and we want to present that to you here. Mondrian's inspiration were landscapes, but also his environment, his perception of the world, whatever happened in his brain, his brain chemistry. And I'm sure that there's some influence to his art that were known to him and others that weren't. And that is what we wanted to adapt and recreate. Because Mondrian isn't alive anymore, unfortunately, we thought, well, let's try it with this internet as the additional component. And also, we would like to have a resilient process that might even be resilient to vandalism. We have technical parameters that we create ourselves that we know, but the input from the Internet is random. We can't influence it. So, this led us to our first experiment. The metaphor is that the brain has neurons connected via synapses and neurotransmitters transport the signals. If you translate that to the internet. You could say the internet is composed of computers which are connected by lines and the datas and protocol uh, the datas are transferred using internet protocols so you see similarities there so we said Mondrian's concept can be transformed into software. So we developed a program called Pete, which is able to make these picture structures, the lines, and fill them with the colors. So now we're at the point where we have a software, but we don't, don't have inspiration yet. The software isn't inspired. And that is what Port Scanny was created for. Well, Port Skinny is the derivation of Port Scanner, like Trainer Trainee, Port Scanner, Port Skinny. Anyone who uses a computer or a server in the internet know that Port Scans are available freely and it doesn't take long for the machine connected to the network to be analyzed. And you can imagine it like Imagine you're walking through a city and approaching a house and looking at the um, uh, doorbells and seeing what names do we have here. Maybe try pressing one of the doorbells and see if anyone answers. And that is what happens with port scans. 
Port scans regularly scan for available services and check whether results are achieved when trying them out. So Port Scanny does just that. It feels and probes the internet for responses, which are typical ports used for emails or remote connections. So just your usual ports. And Port Scanny registers their IP address together with a timestamp. And that data is collected during one minute, and the da data created during that time using port scans is sufficient to create a random component to give to Pete, and Pete creates a painting out of these data. And the outcome is in the style of Mondrian. And it can look like that. That's an example, which you can also see on our website, zldkm.art. Every minute, a new Mondrian image is created. And you can see the parameters and the port scans that led to this picture on the left. What else can inspire our algorithms? If you have a mail survey, you know it. Spam is available everywhere. You just need to have an email address. Spam, you have it. Spam. So it didn't take long for us to receive spam messages in masses. And we might just be the first people happy about spam using these emails to create Mondrian images. On our Instagram channel, we have the same procedure. Every day we have a new Mondrian. You can see the picture and you can see the email that the picture was created based on. So now the question poses itself, aren't we creating them randomly and then just randomly assign any emails or data sets and just claiming that the picture is the outcome? What if this is all a fake? And Stefan will tell you why it isn't. Yeah, we want to make it uh, understandable that this is not going to be, that this is not a fake and, and show you that these images have a connection to text, which is why we invented what we call the generating report, the generation report. Now, to every text and image, this report explains how it was created and how the text served as an inspiration for the image. And the objectives are quite clear. It is to understand the connection between the characters in the text and the elements in the image and to make it easily understandable and the design decisions with this quote random generator were not to be to run a perfect and wild hashing as you would get in dev random under linux but to do without parts of randomness to make it understandable understandable what is actually happening now to make this uh, more understandable we have an example for you here normally a generation report is a very long text file, about 100 kilo kilobytes, and it lists all the steps that were taken to create the image from the text, which characters were used, how were they processed, which decisions were made by the algorithm, which values and positions, which rectangles, colors were chosen. 
And we can't, of course, show you the whole generation of an image, but we can take four decisions and, and see how they are reported. So as an example, we have your first spam email that we input into our generator. And we have pairs of letters highlighted. And what we did with these eight letters altogether, I'm going to explain now. The first two letters are HA from Hello, and the first decision that the algorithm has to make, the automatic Mondrian, is how large should the picture be in terms of width and height. And the first decision is the width, and we said that we wanted to have a width between 300 and 800 pixels, and the letters are now used as random input, as a dice that is being cast to select a number between 300 and 800. And you can imagine the letter H, which is the eighth letter of the alphabet. So you are kind of throwing a 26-faced dice and you are getting an 8 as a result. So you have 26 options for a number between 300 and 800. That's not quite enough. It's, the experts will say there's not enough entropy in, the, in this year. So that's why our automatic, automatic Mondrian uh, goes and takes a second letter, which is the A. A is the first letter of the alphabet. So we first had an 8 and then a 1 on this 26 face dice. And using the formula that, that you see there, we don't want to go into the mathematical details, that gives you the number 209 out of a range from 300 to 800. And that is then linearly scaled to the target. Ah, so first it was in a random number from 27 to 702, and that is scaled onto the 300 to 800 range, giving you a value of 435, and that is going to be the width of the picture. And the same way we deal with the height, and then we arrive at a point where we have to divide a rectangle, and the algorithm decided that it wanted to use the third subvariant of the first variant, so have a large rectangle with a smaller rectangle in it. And one question that has to be asked at this point, at which horizontal position should this new edge of the new rectangle turn up? And that's what this arrow is show showing in that image there. So we need a distance from the left margin, and that's where we take the letters I and R from the spam email. Again, we throw a dice twice and reach the number 200 and, or 149, and that is the distance that we use from the left margin to make this division. And then the algorithm has to decide which color this new rectangle should have. And of course, and for that, it only goes through all the rectangles. And for the rectangle number two, it takes the letters T and I from investment plan, the German word for that, investitionsplan. Uh, again, the dice is cast yielding the number 29. And so that means a bit. If you look at the ranges that are shown in the report there, you will see that 29 is part of the yellow range. Uh, the ranges are not equi equal weight. Um, the next rectangle we'll show you is number 20, and the letters E and I from the spam email yield white, and so on. And you then see the picture that emerges with the rectangle 20 being white and rectangle 2 being yellow. Now that, in principle, finishes the generation of the image, but the actual painting of the image, of course, is only the first step. The main step, admittedly, but after that, the image continues to live and normally get, goes all the way to a gallery. Yes, and we've said that it would be one of our objectives to create a bridge to the world of art and galleries. And for that, we have we saw two options. We found two options. The first one is that we use the electronic virtual product, the image in PNG format, say, and enter that into the art market, but that is probably quite difficult because the market for that is fairly small and it's not easy to communicate where the creation is in that, why should this should be bought. 
or stored as a work of art, <coughs> put up on a website. The problem is that you can't really recognize originals that way. You would have to ent introduce some copy protection mechanism, which we don't like that much. So that is a difficult thing to try and do. So we thought we have to find another way. And another way is that we take these digital images and take them back into the real world and, for example, create photographic prints uh, or other prints uh, through different technologies on canvas or acrylic glass or something. Yeah, there are different options there. Connect it with the report, you can sign that. and. Thus, you have an approach to entering the gallery market. There are originals that you can touch physically, uh, that is tangible, and it's clear that there is an original there, and we have another variable there, which is inspiration, that can also be used in the arts market context. You could say that you link up with authors of poems, for example, and say, we are going to have 10 poems and leading to 10 images, and maybe create a sort of synergy from that. As an input channel, you could use music too, or uh, stock market uh, rates, or, well, whatever. Uh, and one example of such an image you can see here in this picture, in this photo, uh, which kindly was uh, made available to us by Sasha, who bought our first picture. He uh, actually put it in a frame. Um, create the print, creating the first original work of art. But then the question is, how can the price for such a work of art be determined? So first we looked at how galleries in the analog world determine prices, and many galleries use a very quite a simple formula. They use the size of the image, which is width plus height in centimeters, and multiply it by a so-called artist factor. Now this artist factor is in principle a measure for the fame of that artist, and as a guideline you can say for beginners you can say three euros per centimeter and what we now have to do is kind of transfer that to the automatic Mondrian and what we've already decided is that width and height should be converted by a factor of 10 pixels being one centimeter that's how we would carry pixels into the analog world and what's missing of course is the artist factor and you could say that the artist that the automatic mondrian is new so it would be a beginner's artist factor but perhaps the images are quite good already and well i'm not going to say equivalent to mondrian the real one but maybe some step of the way towards him so we ran a test and we asked ourselves how can we find uh, what normal people would think of this kind of imaging that how they how much they could tell apart our images from from authentic mondrian images and because we both studied computer science of course the idea quickly came that we should use a turing test uh, the test that was invented by alan turing to compare computers and real people in the case of Turing, uh, this was developed to, uh, to test an artificial intelligence that was to convince people in a conversation that it was not an artificial intelligence but a human being, and if the human being would believe that, the test would have been passed. Of course, in our case, it's not an artificial intelligence, things are not as complicated, so we took two images, one automatically produced one and one that was actually produced by or created by Mondrian, and we asked normal people that you find on Twitter of course, uh, please choose the real Mondrian out of these two images. And you can see in the results that 49% decided on image A, 42 on image B, and 9% said, well, I cheated, I used Google, so we'll take those out of the evaluation and we can see, well, it's a close result, but 
the wisdom, uh, swarm wisdom worked. Image A is real Mondrian. It's called Trafalgar Square, and Mondrian painted it from 1939 to 1943. And image B is an automatic Mondrian out of a spam email from mid March. Uh, the content of the spam email is a faked dating request, which, for reasons of uh, parental protections we cut here and we would like to repeat this test with two more images so you see two images here one is generated one is an authentic Mondrian and with that we would like to enter into a discussion so which one of these is real or authentic and if you have other questions or comments please feel free to ask them too Okay, that was a very interesting talk. A lot of art and a bit of cyber as well. And we do have a few questions. First, I'd like to thank you for your talk. Thank the two Stefans. One of you two is a data protection commissioner. So the first question now is from someone that uh, perhaps hasn't quite understood the GDPR too well, or maybe has a very unique interpretation of it, because the question is, if you use IPs and dates data from a port scanner, what has to be said regarding the GDPR? I added my doubt, but what's, what's the answer? Yeah, well, uh, yes, it's not to be taken so seriously because these are data that have been kind of pushed onto us, um, voluntarily given up. So in that regard, you can hardly uh, say that there is a problem here. Um, so regarding the GDPR, I I don't think there is anything to consider, but of course, if we do get any queries, we will be happy to answer them. If people would give us IP addresses that at some point might have arrived with us and that we might have stored, then we can find those and we will delete them if we have them. No problem at all. And then we have the inevitable question. It cannot be averted in this context. Why don't you sell your art uh, with the using the non fungible token? Um, well, first of all, digital data can still be copied, even if you write it into whatever number of blockchains as a non-fungible token. And to me, an NFT like that, if I understood it completely, it can be compared to going into a museum, a gallery, and buying an image, taking a picture, turning it around, writing on the paper that this is my image, putting the image into a safe, <clears throat> and then putting the image somewhere. And that's not the way we want to do it. It would be an interesting approach. Um, a question in English that I like. Wouldn't the guesses on which Mondrian is real be random? I would suggest to try with both artificial or both real ones as a baseline. I think that's a very good suggestion. We can try that for the next Divock, maybe, or maybe even earlier. Okay. And then, of course, the question remains, which one is the real Mondrian? C or D? We've seen A or B in the talk. I think A was the authentic one there, and in this case it's actually D. And if you paid attention, you could have seen it in one of the slides earlier. Okay, the vote actually was in favor of B. So you can see how people, to what extent people are wrong. So there is going to be a, a session in Big Blue Button after the talk. Or oh, what is it? Yes, it is Big Blue Button. And 
<coughs> the big blue button service Fragen dot zldkm dot art. So Fragen is German for questions. Dot zldkm dot art. Self-organized Q and A. So. ZLDKM, to remind you, is two people that do art in German, the, the words, first letters of each word. So if you want to talk to the two Stefans, um, we have a few minutes left in theory, which, unless you want to say something, we could simply skip, but we would like to thank you a lot for coming. I have to... Uh, trust this talk and, and take my time for my own question. So, thank you very much for being here. It was